Hello, my name is Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Car Suspension Over 120 Years of Ride and Handling. What I want to do in today's video is talk about torsion beam rear axles. They've been fitted to, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of cars, but they were almost ubiquitous right through the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So let's take a look at them. So this is a picture of a 2009 Mazda 2 uh, suspension. It uses front struts, McPherson struts here, and it uses the rear torsion beam suspension. Now, immediately you can see how compact it is in terms of fitting under the car, and you can also see its relative simplicity. No multi-links, no wishbones, nothing like that. So let's take a look at it in more detail. So the first car, fitted with the torsion beam rear axle, in fact, basically the, the company invented it, was the uh, 1974 Volkswagen Golf and Scirocco. And if we have a look at it here, we can see it comprises a transverse open beam with trailing arms that go to the wheels and then uh, strut style springs and dampers are directly in line with the wheels. Now, this was the first torsion beam rear axle and called a torsion beam because as the wheels go over different bumps, this uh, torsion beam flexes, sometimes called a flex beam axle. And as the car rolls, the torsion beam flexes as well. So it acts as an anti-roll bar. So straight away, we can see some of the advantages. Low parts count uh, because you don't have to have an extra anti-roll bar, as they didn't in this case. Uh, relatively simple construction, and yet it's proved to be astonishingly effective. We're going to look in detail at the pluses and minuses later, but even here, you can see some of the pluses of its simplicity of construction and therefore low cost. Now, in fact, what I didn't really think about until I wrote the book and started doing some more in-depth research is there's basically three different ways that these sorts of rear suspensions can be organized and they then end up having quite different characteristics. So the top one here, we can see it's very much like that original Volkswagen one, trailing arms joined by this torsion beam. And so with trailing arms joined by a torsion beam, the roll center is at the ground level, for example, and there's no uh, change in camber, the angle the wheels lean inwards, going over bumps. The wheels just go up and down. So very simple, and uh, as I said, as that first Volkswagen one was. But then we can go and move the beam to the other end of the system and put the beam in line with the wheels. Now we have almost a dead axle, don't we? A dead axle supported on two trailing links. So uh, Volkswagen and Audi actually used those two extremes uh, quite early on. But these days, uh, torsion beam rear axles typically look more like this, where the torsion beam is not in line with the wheels and the torsion beam is also not in line with the pivot points. And positioning the torsion beam partway along those trailing arms gives the system quite different characteristics. So let's take a look at that in more detail. So here's that same diagram repeated. You can see the light blue torsion beam is partway along the arms. Now, what happens when you go over a one wheel bump? Well, the center point of the torsion beam basically doesn't twist. It, it's the neutral point, if you like. And so you actually get a feel for the behavior of wheels over one wheel bumps with this system if we draw a virtual semi-trailing arm because that's how individual wheels behave when the torsion beam is placed in this sort of location. Now, like with any semi-trailing arm suspension, that means the rear wheels undergo toe change, they point in different directions as they go through their movement, and they also undergo camber change, their angle to the vertical uh, changes. So, semi-trailing arms has actually always been one of my favorites. I think they're, they're much undervalued. And uh, this modern version, this modern iteration of that, has some of the benefits of semi-trailing arms. And that is, as the car rolls, you get more negative camber, which keeps the wheel more vertical to the road, giving better grip. But there are other advantages of this sort of approach as well. And as I say, we'll cover them in more detail in a moment. Now, while the torsion beam 
torsionally twists and therefore resists roll, many cars, and this is an example of an NHW11 uh, Toyota Prius, many cars also put an anti-roll bar within the torsion beam, allowing the behavior of the car to be tuned. And so, for example, if you have a torsion beam uh, rear axle car and it has got the anti-roll bar within the beam, it's very easy to change that anti-roll bar for a, a stiffer bar, which in most front wheel drives will result in less, uh, less understeer. So this uh, little bar fits in here. Again, it doesn't have a high component count. It doesn't have links with bushes at each end. It's basically bolted into place. Uh, again, very, very effective. There's another thing to notice here as well, and that is, on the Prius and on many, many cars these days, uh, there's an extra little link at the front of the, uh, the, the trailing arms. And uh, that little link is a tow control link. I said that there are tow changes when the uh, car undergoes cornering, and you don't want those tow changes to be outwards. You don't want the wheels, the outer wheel pointing outwards because then the car will be more inclined to oversteer. And many torsion beam rear axles these days have these tow control links where they flex a little bit and stop the wheel, the outer wheel, the loaded wheel from towing out. And here's another example of one of those tow control links, this time on a, on a Mazda, the same Mazda we saw in the opening slide. All right, so what makes this system really good? Why has it been adopted on so many billions of cars? And it's worth looking at these points because I've never really seen them articulated in this way. Firstly, the rear suspension is used at the back. The simple has simple construction. It comprises just a welded beam with trailing arms and a couple of rubber bushes. When I first saw this design many years ago, I couldn't believe it. It was all welded together and yet it, it happily twisted. Uh, but obviously those welds are under a lot of stress. The, a torsion beam uh, rear suspension has a flat main assembly, allows a low floor, critically important in terms of packaging. It integrates the wheel location with an anti-roll bar, as I said a moment ago, sometimes an additional anti-roll bar is placed within the beam, so you have less component count, lower cost again. Low unsprung mass, don't think of that, that very often, do you? But if you compare it with uh, lots of arms being used to locate a wheel, here we've only got really one trailing arm. And so, of course, the, uh, the mass of the suspension, uh, which is unsprung, is, is going to be fairly light. It requires no subframe. The, the loads are fed straight into the monocoque body. It has a low motion ratio. What well, that means is because the springs and dampers are typically placed well outboard, right next to the wheel, the wheel movement and the spring and damper movement are very similar in magnitude, which has huge advantages, huge advantages in terms of damping and also advantages in not requiring such a heavy spring. It doesn't have to be so stiff. With appropriate bush design, gives roll understeer. So as the car rolls, that outer wheel, instead of towing out or staying at zero toe, tows in a bit. And that gives much more car stability, which manufacturers are always after. Gives anti-lift under braking. Isn't that an interesting one? So if you imagine the brake here at my elbow and the brake is applied, it tries to rotate the arm that way. And so it pulls the back of the car downwards. There's less lift at the back of the car with trailing arm rear suspension under brakes. And another one, no camber or tow change with load. So unlike traditional semi-trailing arms, when you put a big load into the boot, into the trunk, and the car sits down on a suspension, semi-trailing arms go like that, and so you get negative camber. Think of an old uh, Datsun, Nissan, uh, old BMW, old Mercedes. But with uh, torsion beam rear axles, because both wheels are going up, it's not just one wheel going up, both wheels are going up, it just rises on its bushes. Uh, the, the torsion beam suspension just rises like that on its front bushes and there's no change in tow or camber of those rear wheels with load. Now, that is a stunning list of advantages, low in cost and yet it achieves all of those things and so you can start to see why it's been used in so many hundreds of millions, billions, I don't know, an enormous number of cars. But there are some negatives. The, the one that always strikes me are those high stress concentrations where the beam is welded to the trailing arms, possibility of world cracking. I've never seen a, 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 a torsion beam rear axle that has actually cracked in a suspension, but they must have done a lot of testing with the metallurgy of the steel and the, the, the metallurgy of the, wheel, uh, the welds. Uh, you don't want embrittlement around those welds, do you? If you don't have tow correction bushes, there'll be unacceptable lateral force oversteer. In other words, oversteer in cornering. 
And so, uh, as I said, pretty well every torsion beam rear axle that you'll see has got special bushes. It might be those little extra links at the front or the bushes might be inclined to give the same, the same effect. They're not uh, on the longitudinal axis of the car. They often point inwards. Next time you're under a car with torsion beam rear axle, have a look at how they're controlling that uh, oversteer, which otherwise would occur. There's poor lateral force stiffness. So because you've got those trailing arms, when you apply a lateral force to it, the whole thing tries to twist and go sideways. There isn't a, a link that goes in uh, laterally from the wheel in compression or extension, for example. And the last one uh, is probably the main reason why it's largely now died. Limited potential for optimising ride comfort. Ride comfort is a critical part of suspension design. I think the spring and damping rates are all way too high on most cars, but what most cars these days have achieved is they cope with impacts uh, much better. So if the wheel hits a, a strip going across the, uh, the road, a filler strip, because the wheel is able to move backwards a bit, most suspension systems are designed with bushes such that the wheel can move back a fraction. Uh, when it hits those bumps, it absorbs the harshness much, much better than cars of the past. But with this system, if you make those front bushes soft enough to allow that uh, rearwards movement, then you've got big problems in controlling toe, uh, toe changes in cornering and so on. So torsion beam rear axles, an amazing interesting story, amazingly interesting suspension design covered in my book, car suspension over 120 years of ride and handling. I go right back to the mid 1890s and right up to current suspension design, covering them all, all the significant ones in quite a lot of detail. The book's available now from Amazon in your country. Thank you.